Well, good morning and welcome to any visitors. We are grateful that you've come uh, to worship the living God with us here at Southside Bible Church. Be praying for our college group. They're away on a retreat, a camping trip, so we'll pray for their safety. As a church, we're currently studying through Peter's first epistle, if you'll turn there now. Uh, it has been a, a rich study. I taught this when I was doing youth ministry over 20 years ago, and it's just uh, exploding in my heart as we're studying through this again. And Peter's writing to a church that has been scattered throughout what we would call modern-day Turkey. Persecution has been mounting upon the church. Uh, they're on the eve of the Neronian persecution where Nero would persecute them, where history books tell us of the atrocities that were poured out upon the Christians during that time in history. Peter is seeking to establish these Christians with the rise of opposition and hatred being poured out upon them. He is teaching them how to think and live so as to go in the furnace of affliction and persecution and to come out as purified, refined gold, a faith that would be tested and tried and proven and stronger, more resolved and steadfast after going through such trials. And so he begins where we should begin uh, when in the fire we're to look at our great salvation. In the first 12 verses, there are no commands. There are just indicatives, which are statements of fact, realities of what we have in Jesus Christ. And it's a call in verse 3 for us to bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is so important in the midst of great trials to worship God for what he has done, what he will do, and what he is doing in our lives. And so there are going to be times when we, we feel like uh, they're falling apart down here. Everything's coming undone. And Peter's calling us, come now and lift your eyes in the midst of your trial to see an enthroned God who is doing as he pleases and only as he pleases. You may be losing your earthly inheritance but your heavenly one is reserved for you in heaven. It is secure and it is kept, and you are secure and kept, we will see this morning. Your fingers will not let go of Jesus Christ because his hands are over them holding on so you will not fail. We can't become indifferent or apathetic to our great salvation. The salvation, he'll tell us in a few verses, that angels long to look into. They are so enamored with mercy in the gospel. They just, they long to look into this. It is the best news. It is fresh and eternal news that does not fade or wither. A salvation that began, Peter said, in eternity past, you were chosen. It's a salvation that has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a salvation that has an inheritance reserved for us, and you are protected then by the power of God. And so I'll ask you this morning, are these just doctrines to you? Or are these the greatest realities that you have ever known? Have you been born again to these realities? Are these what grip you, hold you, own you, control you? If you are in the fire this morning, look up and look at this great salvation that God has given to you. That's really what you need right now in the fire. Just lift your eyes from everything in the scene and look again to this great salvation that hell itself can't take away from the child of God. So I call every believer in this place, no matter what you are facing, to bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Shall we go before our God and pray? Father, we bless your name. You, you alone are worthy. You are worthy to be worshiped and to be ascribed honor. Lord, we adore you. Uh, we, we love that scene in Revelation that we just sang where uh, you just, Christ is worshiped and adored. And you are holy. And so we, we thank you for this gospel. We thank you for how far back it goes into the eternal mind and heart of our God and how far future it will go to the eternities of, of forever and millions and billions of years. It will never come to an end. God, lift every heart this morning. They're in the trenches. They're hurting. They're struggling. God, give them the eyes of faith right now to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let their hearts be lifted at the goodness of their God and the future that is laid up for them. Encourage their hearts here this morning in the word of God. Lord, we bless you. We bless you, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to review just a little bit. It's, it's been a couple weeks, so I feel great liberty this morning to take my time in reviewing. So let's look. We began in 1 Peter 1. The source of our salvation is, is, he says, it's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The very source of all of salvation, it's not you, it is God. It is God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit. So the very source of salvation is God. The next thing we looked at was the motive of our salvation. The motive of our salvation in verse 2 or verse 3 is according to His great mercy. There's an attribute in God, if you look into His heart, that's called mercy. He has an attribute of mercy or none of us would be sitting here this morning. Mercy is really, it's a word that makes reference to a person's condition. It draws something out based on one's condition. And our condition is we were miserable. We were wretched. We were separated from God. We were without any kind of hope. We were spiritually dead. We were naked and ashamed before God. I don't think you can use hyperbole hyperbole of how bad our condition was when we were born into this world. We needed someone to have mercy on us. There was no hope of remedy in our own hands. We could not refix it or repair it. All we could do was lay there and be in need. And that drew out the heart of God. Mercy, uh, because of our condition, that someone could help us. And so because of our condition, you cannot use hyperbole of the greatness of the mercy of God that he showed to us while we were in that state. The mercy of God. Every one of us should testify this morning, I lived in that condition, and the mercy of God caused me to be born again to a, a living hope. The mercy of God, I ascribe all of my hope, everything. The reason I'm out of that condition, I can do nothing else but give God glory because he's a merciful God, and he was merciful to me. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, said, God's mercy sweetens all of his other attributes. It, it takes holiness. It takes every attribute of God, and it sweetens it, of how they have all worked together to bring mercy both to Jew and to Gentile. It's purely the mercy of God alone, then, that we stand in grace, that we've been born again to a living hope. Do you stand on this beautiful ground this morning? Uh, we're singing and worshiping because I stand on the mercy of God alone. Thirdly, the method that God used then, we see the source is God, the motive was His mercy. The method that God used then of us in this bad, dead condition is that He caused us to be born again. Mercy needed a way to go from the heart of God to alleviating our miserableness and our fallenness, and it was to cause us to be born again. We were spiritually dead. We were corpses, and so a patch job would have never worked. A little renovation was of no use. We needed regeneration. We needed a, a new birth. We needed to start completely new. Moral reform was no use. We needed matchless grace to fix our remedy and our condition. And so by mercy, God spoke life into dead corpses. Let there be life. He put his spirit within us. He made us alive. He joined us to Jesus Christ. And we have been raised from the dead as Christ was. He recreated us. He rebirthed us. We have been born again by God. We now have spiritual life within us because God birthed us. He gave us life. And what was it unto? Unto what? Peter tells us it was unto, in verse 3, a living hope, the hope of mankind. I want you to hear this clearly. Every hope of mankind is either dead or it is in the process of dying. Every hope in this world is a dying hope. If you've come here with any other hope but Jesus Christ is your central hope, I can sit with you and show you it is a dead hope. 
How many sit here this morning with hopes of happiness and peace and something other than God? There's something that you are looking in. This is what will make me happy. This is my hope. If this could change, if this would work out, then I could finally have hope. Paul said, if we have hoped in Christ only in this world, we're among all men most to be pitied. That would be a dead hope. A dead hope is all taken away when you die. So whatever you're hoping in is when you die, it dies. It will be a dying hope or it will die. And so everything other than what Peter is talking about this morning is a dead hope. When you die, it will die. And so have you walked in here this morning with a dead hope? Have you come in here, uh, just everything that you're looking for is not the hope of what we've been born again to, this living hope. You're just still looking for something else in this world, and you're never happy. Uh, Every time you think you get it, you're like Solomon, it's chasing the wind, it didn't really make me happy. And if you sit here in this condition this morning, I have amazing hope for you. God offers you a, a living hope of eternal life with him. There's an answer to your empty hopes, and it's not the lottery. It's not something changing. It's the unchanging living God who's been resurrected from the dead who will give life to all who will call upon his name. So we have been born again to a living hope, and this hope cannot die, and this hope cannot diminish. Jesus tells us, Paul tells us, nothing can separate us from this hope. Nothing, it can't be taken away from you. It's called the hope of glory. It's it's steadfast, it's sure, it's eternal. It's the one thing I can bank everything on. It can't be taken away. Nothing. How can we be so certain, pastor, of this hope? Help me here. All of my other hopes that I have ever had in my life have been dashed, uh, or, or they're being dashed, or they're about to be dashed. What what is my hope of spending eternity with God in paradise? How can I have anything that is a certain hope when everything else in my life never has been? And that's our fourth point that we've looked at, then the means. The means, he says, is through the resurrection, in verse 3, of Jesus Christ from the dead. So I'm still reviewing if you weren't here last time I preached. Okay? You with me? This is beautiful. Through the resurrection. If Christ is not raised, your hope is in vain. So if Christ has not been raised from the dead, you've got a dead hope. And so I want to remind you again who is writing this epistle. Peter had lost hope in this world and in himself. Peter was a God-fearing Jew. He was a follower of Jesus Christ while he walked this earth. He was waiting for that promised Messiah that the Scriptures promised. He would come one day and make everything right. He would throw down their enemies of the Roman oppression that they now lived under. He would be a greater David who would rule the nations, and they were waiting for this Messiah. And they thought Jesus Christ was that. And now the victor, his hope, has been put on a cross and mocked and ridiculed by the whole world, breathed his last breath and died and is put in a grave. His hope was dead and buried. And secondly, Peter lost hope in himself. He told, Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, no way, I will never deny you. If all of these other people deny you, I never will. I look within my heart. I love you too much. I could never deny you, Jesus. And we know the story well that he ended up denying him three times. And on the third one, he cursed and said, I do not even know this man. And it says he went out and he grieved. That Greek word was for grieving the death of a loved one. And so Peter went out and grieved deeply. He had lost hope, and he was completely devastated. And then he's hiding in an upper room, despairing and afraid, completely hopeless. And early Sunday morning, Mary comes running in and says, they've taken away my Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they have laid him. And Peter and John run to the tomb, and he is gone. And all there is is linen linen wrappings, wrappings laying on the floor, and, and they go back And Jesus appears to Mary, and she goes back and says, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. And Peter finds that he had risen just as he said, and his life now has been changed to a living hope, a hope 
that even his own crucifixion could not take away. He would go be crucified upside down. Peter would, he, he had a living hope that you can nail me to a tree and you can't take away my hope. It's now a living hope because of Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. So where do we get this new hope? We get it in Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died on a cross for our transgressions. Jesus Christ who was buried in a tomb and the literal physical Jesus Christ was raised on the third day and is now seated in victory at the right hand of God. And Peter says later, so that he could bring us to God. Hope is being restored to God. And ultimately, one day, the whole cosmos, Peter says in his second epistle, is going to be restored to God and everything is going to be made right. And so that is our blessed hope. And so this can't just be Pollyanna theology. It can't just be, I hope that everything is going to work out. As a shepherd, I see this probably the most common. I, I think this could change. I think uh, if we get chemo, this could fix that. And everybody's looking for something that can change and their circumstances might turn or twist. It's got to be better than that. That's a dead hope. That is a dead hope. And we need a living hope. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a guarantee because we are now united in Christ. And as he has been raised, we are guaranteed, we are tied to the coattails of Jesus Christ. We are going to be raised as certain as he is right now at the right hand of God. Our dead bodies will live even if they die. We will have eternal life that is our living hope. We've been born again to that. Death could not hold Jesus. He conquered death. He's given it victory. We have been born again to an absolute living hope. That is what we are alive to, people of God. That is our hope. That is what we celebrate every day. We come every day celebrating again our hope. I have something this world does not have. They have a dead hope. I've got a living hope that every day is alive because Jesus Christ is alive. This is our blessed hope. My hope is as certain as the empty tomb in Jerusalem. So what is this hope? What is this hope? Well, well we are adopted into the family of God when we are born again. And Peter now, we're going to take up where we left off now in verse 4, is that you're going to get an inheritance. So look with me in verse 4. Here's our blessed hope. We are going to obtain an, an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Our hope of what we've been born again to, that was secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is that we have an inheritance. Something that we get at the end of all of this. We have an inheritance. And Peter wants us to understand about this inheritance. Is first, he says, there's three descriptions of it. It's imperishable. That Greek word meant not corruptible or not liable to decay. So it, it, it can't be corrupted. It's not going to decay. It won't deteriorate and just fall apart like every other treasure on this earth. Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, they're going to be moth and rust can come and destroy your earthly treasures. So set your mind on your heavenly treasures, the reward, the inheritance that we are looking at. It's, was, this term was used in secular Greek, and it meant to be unravaged by an invading army. And it's an interesting choice of words that Peter grabbed here because Israel's inheritance, as you look at it, they received the land of Canaan. And it was the land flowing with milk and honey throughout the Old Testament. And how many times was it uh, plundered and invaded by armies? Uh, Jerusalem, the holy city, was devastated and leveled at least 17 times throughout its history. And at current, when this was being written, it is now occupied by Roman authority. And so their inheritance kept getting plundered and taken away and removed from them again and again and again. And so our inheritance, as you'll listen, Peter said, we're aliens. Our first description in verse 1, you are aliens, you don't belong here. You live here, but your citizenship is in heaven. And so you are, are aliens on this earth. And so your true inheritance, your true home can never be ravaged, it can never be plundered, and it can never be destroyed. It can't decay. 
This treasure cannot be taken or stolen or robbed or plundered. Hallelujah. We spend most of our days trying to secure and protect our treasures from being stolen. We buy softwares, we invest in insurances, we hide it in things, we put them in safes. We try to do everything we can that our treasures will not be taken away. If our country goes down, which I think it will one day, so will all of your treasure. And so my question this morning is, why would we spend all of the days, all of our days on that kind of treasure, accumulating, seeking it, making that your main goal when you're an alien and your citizenship is in heaven? I have no problems with savings and retirement. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about giving your life to these treasures. And this is, if if you looked at your life, your thoughts, how you spent them this week, how much is it on earthly treasure? How much is it on that we've been born again to a living hope of this place where there's treasure that nothing can take it away? If I believe that, if I live like that, I'm going to be an alien here on this earth. I'm going to live different than anyone else who's trying to get all of their treasure and find their hope right here because my hope is seated at the right hand of God. This treasure cannot be taken away. If If you preserve it, your earthly treasures, you will die, and then your loved ones will fight over it the rest of your days. It's a dead hope. I've been around long enough. It, it, it isn't as cool as you think it is to store up your treasure and hand it off to your kids to go ruin it and then ruin your grandkids. It, it's, it's a dead hope, okay? So some of you are going to be mad at me after the service, but I want you to hear it now. That's a dead hope. That's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, I want something that's imperishable and can't be plundered. Secondly, Peter says this treasure is undefiled. Everything is defiled and stained and defective on this earth. Everything fails and breaks and falls apart. You, you get a, a new car and you, you park it so you've got to walk further so no one will door dink you, and you get door dinked anyways. You, you, you get a new house, and I remember when I moved into my first one and we put this big couch on it, and it was linoleum when you came in, and we tore it. And then the couch fell and bashed in the drywall, and it was like, welcome to your new house. <laughs> Everything decays. Everything that you put your hope in in this world, it wears out, it's, it gets defiled, and it decays. Everything is polluted and infected. The pollution of sin just spreads, and it is defiling. The best of this earth, Paul looked at it, and he said, it's manure, I count everything on this earth lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul says, I just want that treasure. There's one thing I'm running for. I'm forgetting what lies behind, and I'm reaching forward to that prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, which is called inheritance. I want Christ. Christ is my inheritance. That's what I'm after. That's what I am running for. Paul says, I run for the prize. I am running for that. There's my focus. I'm looking at the finish line of Christ. One thing I do, inheritance. Don't live like this perishing world in their inheritance. We've been born again to this. We've been made alive to this hope. And this is the finish line. Finish line is to, to get to Christ in eternity and glory forever with him. That's the finish line, not to get comfortable in America and get your tent stakes down here. And thirdly, this inheritance, it won't fade away. Now, this referred to flowers, those beautiful, they're, they're kind of blooming as I was driving in this morning. There are flowers everywhere and they're gorgeous. And it's this, this flower that blooms and then it, the cold will start coming and it will wither and it will die. All of its beauty just dies. The treasure in heaven, though, which is the fair flower of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. His beauty never fades and it never withers. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, Being with him for eternity, guys, it will never grow old. Uh, We heard about this in Sunday school, the beauty of Christ. It it never grows old. When we've been there 10,000 days, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Newton truly got it. And so what I want you to hear this morning This is our hope. This is what the mercy of God causes us to be born again to. This is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ secured for us. This is why we bless the name of our God. 
that he has stored up for us such a gift and such a treasure. We have a living hope. And in verse 4, Peter tells us that it's reserved in heaven for you. The Greek word, it, it means to guard, to protect. Uh, it, it's, uh, I don't want to get too technical, but it's, it's, called, it's a perfect passive participle. It means God is doing this, and it means that the inheritance is presently and continually being guarded for you. And so God is guarding this continually, presently. It, it is protected. It's, it's guarded. It's reserved for you. So who's guarding it? I got something better than Fort Knox. God is guarding your inheritance. How do you steal a treasure from God? You got, you got any answers? How do, you, how do you take away something from God? It's being protected by God. You can't tell me anything more secure or better than that God has got my inheritance protected. No one's going to steal it. It can never be taken away. It can never be diminished. Jesus said, I go and I prepare a place for you. The hope that is laid up for the child of God. We shouldn't be able to contain our praise because of what God has for us. And I don't think we live into this enough. We've been born again to it. It's a living hope. It's what the believer stays and keeps his mind and his heart. I look back at what Jesus has done and I look forward to where he is and where all of this is going. It's a living hope and it will make you live different on this earth. You'll be an alien. This can make you be someone who isn't putting your tent stakes down here trying to get the gusto and grab everything you can on this life. You're going to be different than anybody else in this world because I have a living hope and that's where all my life is moving and pointing and going towards. Take away my earthly treasure and you can't touch me because it's reserved by God in heaven for me and no one can take that. Is that what separates you from this world or is it just some doctrines that you nod to? This is getting to the very root and heart of Christianity. Yeah, but I love my election. I can't get over that God chose me and set his love on me before the foundation of the world. That affects me every day. I can't get over that. I love what Christ came to this earth and did to secure my salvation. I could look at the old rugged cross every day. It's beautiful. It has a wondrous attraction to me. I love that I've been born again, that I, I lived 21 years dead with hopes that were dying, and I love this new hope that God has made my heart alive to and that my life has been given to ever since. I love that God caused me to be born again. I love how secure that treasure is that's waiting for me. I love that it's protected by God. It just makes me, I don't have to worry about it. It's protected. But here's my big concern right now, this morning, is until that day, till I get to inheritance, uh, I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Oh, Lord, I feel it. I, I struggle. I, I drift. I wander. I meander. I have all these battles. In a, in a few chapters, Peter says the devil is, is ro roaring about seeking whom he may devour. I got a devil who wants to destroy me. I got a world that's trying to conform me to its image. It preaches at me, sometimes really outright, sometimes subtly. It's trying to bring me into its suck hole on a daily basis. So I, I love the inheritance, God, but it's gonna, gonna be like my whole life. Just another thing held out that I just can't get to. Just another dead hope for me. Thanks, Pastor, but this didn't help me at all. You just made me a little darker. That, that doesn't help me at all. There's this incredible inheritance, but if you knew my heart and you knew what I was battling this morning, I don't have a lot of hope for that inheritance that I'm waiting for because of me today. So what I need, I need something really certain. From now until the day I die, if that doesn't get fixed, I don't care that love was set on me before the foundation of the world and I get this beautiful inheritance. If there's not something that can hold me from this day till the day I die, there, there's no hope. This whole, it's, it's the weak link in the chain. It breaks. And so I need something then to hold this from now till then that's very securing. So what I need is certainty that I won't fall away, become apostate, or chuck my faith. Without that, this is no comfort to me. 
So what God does uh, to make our hope certain, I think this is the key piece to what we really need this morning, is he does something a little more. God does more than just saying, you know what, from now till that day you die, I gave you a bunch of help. I gave you my Bible. I gave you the church. I gave you ordinances and I gave you prayer. May the best man win. That doesn't do much for me. That doesn't do much. Well, I I gave you free will. And God says, I'll never overpower that, so use it wisely. I had someone just last week say that God is a gentleman and he'll never overpower your will. Uh, That scares me. God, overpower my will. You overpowered it to make me born again. Overpower it to keep me walking and going with you. So there are two wrong ways then and maybe a lot more of how to think about from here to glory. And it's a journey. And the first one is I have to hold on to the end. That's what this is saying. I gotta hold on to the end. And if my grasp fails and my hand falls off of Christ, I fall into the eternal abyss and I'm damned in hell forever. That's absolutely no security. And some of you are sitting here with that mindset is that my hands are getting loose and if they let go, I'm going into hell forever. The other view is I have a safety line attached to me and as I'm going across the great ravine, if I slip, that little thing on me is just gonna swing low sweet chariot right to heaven. So there's no fears, I got security on me. If I fall, I'm in heaven, no big deal. That's called false security, and that's what a lot of people today call eternal security, and it's no security at all. That's a lie. That isn't even what the Bible teaches. Both of those views are wrong, and we will see that in Peter. I want you to understand what Peter is telling us here. It's so much more beautiful than either one of those views. So he tells us, that our treasure is protected. It's in God's Fort Knox, it's safe. Then he tells us that you are protected to get that treasure. Look with me in verse five. Verse five, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So God says you're protected by his power for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, which is what we call inheritance. So you are protected by God's power for that inheritance that we just looked at in verse four. So praise God, child of God. You were born again by God to a living hope and you have an inheritance. And this says the power of God will protect you until you inherit it. So until, from now till you die, you're, you're encompassed in what's called the power of God or the grace of God. The gates of hell will not overcome it. This is what we call the grace of God. I want you to hear what Paul described what we're looking at here in Romans eight twenty nine. Paul said, for whom he foreknew, and that's what we studied in verse two, for whom he foreknew, God, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. God predetermined those ones would one day be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And we looked at that in verse two, when the spirit set you apart. He called you, he gave you life, he birthed you. And whom he effectually called, these he justified. And those are the ones he declares not guilty, by the imputation of Jesus Christ's life and death. And those whom he justified, these he also glorified. So from justification to the inheritance, God's saying his grace will do all of those. It is absolutely protected and certain that God will bring his people to this inheritance. So he doesn't hold out an inheritance and say, I hope you're strong enough to make it to it. My hope is from God and through him and to him. And so I pray that you're hearing this. Your confidence is in God and not in yourself. It is not your strength and your wisdom and your effort are not what are gonna get you to the other side for your inheritance. It's God. And so I'll ask you, does your life prove that out in this unswerving, relying trust that it's God who's gonna bring me to glory? And so please hear what this is saying. 
you have been saved. This is the danger. Uh, there is danger, though, on the way to your inheritance. There's a real and present danger. We need protection. This doesn't mean home free, now I get to just sit back for the ride. There is a battle. And it isn't, hey, let's enjoy the cruise. You're on the love boat from now till you get to glory. But remember in Ephesians 6, I said you're on a battleship on your way to glory now. There is a battle. And what this means is we are on enemy territory. The God of this world is the devil. And we are aliens. We, we live here, but our home is in heaven. And you, you will need letters, letters like 1 Peter because of all the opposition. The world is against you, the devil, the flesh. You have so many enemies now from birth to the time you get to glory. It's a battle. But God fights the battle and he says this, you will win by the grace of God. You will be brought safely across the Jordan to heaven. For his name is at stake and he will lose none of his own. Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. Our protection is the power of God. But the question is, how does the power of God then work practically? Is it just the power of God is over me and he just brings me to glory and it doesn't matter, there's no problems, there's no battles? That is not at all what this Bible teaches. And I want to look at how does the power of God protect us and guarantee with certainty and brings us to glory that we will not fail, we will not go apostate, and we will not fall away. What did God create in verse 3? He caused you to be born again to a living hope. And so in verse 3, God opened your eyes and he gave you the gift of faith. That's why Ephesians 2 says it's the gift of God, this faith that you have. So God is the one who gave you faith. He is, gave you that gift at the new birth. And I want you to hear what he's saying now is he will sustain that faith to the very end until it becomes reality when you behold the Lord Jesus Christ. So faith is not a gift for the day. I believe in Jesus, but it's a gift for the rest of the journey till we get home. And so I need you to think real hard. I hate to do this at the end of the sermon. I should have done it at the beginning, but work with me here. How does God do that then? How does God protect us by his power to bring us to glory? And it's just this little phrase in verse five. He says, uh, you're protected by the power of God through faith. You're protected by God, the power of God, and the instrument that he's using here is through faith. And so this is the key to the whole section. Right after being chosen, you get faith at the new birth. And then uh, you get faith, uh, you get an inheritance. And in verses 7 through 9, we're going to see you have a faith that's going to be purified and refined in fire. So he's going to strengthen that faith and he's going to purify it. This whole section is about faith. And so it's through faith that God is going to protect us. So how can we keep, uh, how, what can keep you from co crossing this big, this big chasm on your way to eternity that you've been born again to an inheritance? What must God protect us from that we make it? What does he need to protect us from? Is it death? Death brings you to your inheritance, believer. Is it suffering? No. In the next verses, suffering purifies your faith. It strengthens it. Is it Satan roaring around in a few chapters trying to devour? What does he want to devour? He wants to devour your faith. Temptation in 1 Peter 2.11, you're going to have lusts that wage war against you trying to defeat your faith. So what is it that could keep us from entering heaven's shores? In the book of Hebrews, it was unbelief. And they were going apostate and they were looking and they were seeing all that Jesus was, seeing his power, and they were walking away from the, from the faith and going back to Judaism. They were going apostate. So what God must do is protect us from unbelief, from chucking this whole thing. Faith is the instrument that the power of God protects to get you to glory. That's amazing. That is where the battle is. The battle is in our faith, to put on the old shield of faith. Faith is the issue as to whether you get home or not. God will protect us by sustaining our faith. So he guarantees that he will protect your faith to the very end. And yet we have a personal human responsibility 
to hit the means of grace like we're learning in the Sanctification Sunday School to feed this faith, to grow this faith. God has given us means that He uses to grow faith. He will give you trials. He will let you think through life and learn things. God is always working to grow, perfect, strengthen, and purify your faith. That's how He's protecting you here this morning. And I, you should marvel that you woke up this morning with faith. That's the power of God protecting you for a salvation to be revealed at the last time. God's power will protect us. God's power will hold my faith. And this is what I love about being a pastor. Maybe just one of the things, I like a lot of things about being a pastor. But I have seen your faith almost in every life here tried. I've watched it battered. I've seen it assaulted. I've seen it weakened. But what I have watched every time is the truth comes and it just buckles you back up and it strengthens you again and you hope in God purer than you did before the trial. And so that's the miracle of God in every life here is you've had your faith assaulted. And it's been t the testimonies of the baptisms a few weeks ago. Uh, I've watched it again and again where all hell will come against you and, and God takes it, puts you in a furnace and he brings you out with this faith that is pure and stronger and more beautiful. He handpicks every trial, every circumstance. You see how protected you are? He'll never put you in a fire that will just, your faith will be dead and gone and never come back. He'll only put you in exactly, it says, what is necessary, how long, to what degree. Uh, Mike, I'm looking at Mike here, his testimony a few weeks ago, he's, he's, he's ready to kill himself in depression, and all of a sudden, God brings him out, and what has come out is this man who loves and trusts God in a way like he's never seen before. And I just keep looking at, at all of your lives, and they, he always comes. He will not just let you die. You're protected by the power of God. Does that make you feel ind indispensable, indisposable, uh, untouchable. It's beautiful that every one of our testimonies is how God has kept our faith, grown it, and strengthened it. I feel like uh, Peter. Where else could I go? You alone have the words of life. God, you are my hope. There's a disconnect, though, that I see quite often in my own heart and in others. And so I, w I want you to listen up. A couple of you look sleepy. This is worth the price of admission, which was zero, wasn't it? So I can't lose. We learn doctrine, we grow in the Word, we get truth, and we can dot every I and cross every T in doctrine, and we know what a tulip is, and we take 10 courses on the attributes of God, and we learn all of this, and you just say, I got it. I've got this. We, we love it. We debate it. We argue it, and we even ridicule people who don't understand it but I don't believe it when I lose my job. And I don't believe it when I get sick or cancer or if I lose a loved one. And suddenly I, I, I know all these things, but I don't believe it. And so there's the journey in the Christian life is what we know to be true and what we live upon the truth. And so that's the faith and the trust and where God is working in each one of our lives to, to grow us to that place where if I believe what the Word of God says, I would just walk to glory without a problem. Because every problem that would come, I, I understand it. I trust it. It just, if we had a faith that was unwavering, we, we would. We would just walk through everything that would come upon us. And so there's our battle. So it's important that we bridge what we learn to how we live in light of that truth. There, there's something that helps this and, and brings it together, and next week it's called a furnace. And so next week I'm going to show you that why we don't hate the furnace. The furnace marries those two things together. Prosperity does not usually join them together. It's usually the, the furnace. So our faith is we believe these things. I believe he's sovereign. Do I live into that sovereignty? This is how God preserves and protects us is by our faith. He's growing it, he's increasing it, he's sustaining it. He prunes the branches of it. He's at work to purify our faith. This is what keeps us holding to Christ and this blessed hope that we have to the very end. It's not little pixie dust that he throws on us that protects us, it's our faith. 
And God himself then is protecting us through faith as he's growing it and deepening it and doing mighty things and we are doing the means that God does to strengthen faith. So if he says water faith and it will grow, so I, I put water, I do everything I can on my faith and God is the one who causes it to grow. And it is beautiful that every one of you can give glory to God because your faith has been tested, tried, and it still loves Jesus Christ. That's how you're going to make it to the very end. God has promised none of your faith will fail if you are a child of God. He will, he will keep this and hold it. And if you're sitting here this morning going, I think I've gone so far, I don't have any, I, I just got a mustard seed left. Well, that's all he says you need. And he made sure that mustard seed didn't go out. And so I want you to just marvel at a God who protects us and keeps our faith through whatever comes into it. We fight for faith. We trust God to protect our faith and to bring us home. And the only reason I still believe this morning is because of God. So therefore, we bless the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to close, this is my last thought, with a, with a good example and so I'm going to actually go to the person who is writing this epistle. And Jesus Christ, in Luke 22, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan has asked permission to sift Peter like wheat. That means to strain the faith out of you like he tried to do with Job. Uh, that scares me. But Jesus says, I've prayed for you. What? I prayed that your faith would not fail, Peter. And after you've turned, which says, my prayers always get answered, go strengthen your brothers. So the sovereignty in the garden is who's Jesus praying to? God the Father. Keep Peter from not believing. The reason Peter went out and wept after that third time when he said, I don't even know the man, is because the, the, God's prayer was answered. Instead of going and hanging himself like Judas, he went and he repented bitterly and deep because Almighty God answered that prayer and he moved in to protect Peter from the devil trying to sift him like wheat. He was kept by the power of God. And Peter knows experientially about what he is writing right now in this epistle. Peter was restored, we saw in John 21. He is now writing this letter to strengthen the believers who are going to be persecuted greatly. And 2,000 years later, this letter is to strengthen our faith in the midst of a growing persecution and affliction that's coming upon the church of God. And so my, may your faith will not fail because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God praying for you this very day. You are protected by the power of God. My faith will not break because it's indestructible, because it's kept by God, not by how strong my fingers are. Isn't that good news? It's kept by the power of God, Timmy. My human responsibility is to grow faith and to believe what you learn, to be amazed, though, that your faith is kept by that power of God and not yourself. And so do you see why Peter is worshiping God in the midst of such a difficult time? So this morning I'm asking you again, lift your eyes from your problems and your sufferings and look at your salvation and believe that in eternity past, God put his love upon you and that Christ came to this earth and hung on a cross and died for you. And that the Spirit has awakened you and He's given you faith and He made you alive to God. And that you have a living hope through the resurrection. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Do you believe that? Even if I die, I'll live. And you have an inheritance that can't be taken away. It's God Himself. Your inheritance is God and it's reserved and it's protected for you. You will get your inheritance and you are protected from now till that day by the power of God with a faith that he gave you and a faith that he is growing and deepening and perfecting and purifying uh, for this inheritance 
that we will receive one day. To God be the glory. He gets all the glory. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift of what he's given us in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the name of, of our God and Father, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go in prayer to this God. Father, I thank you for the beauty of this verse. Lord, as believers, we could meditate on this every day. There is so much um, depth and glory and beauty in these verses. And so, Lord, let our eyes look upon them again. Help us to quit putting our hope in the things that pass away and the things that perish. Oh, God, lift our eyes again to this living hope, this living hope that was secured on Calvary's tree, this living hope that we've been born again into. God, I thank you that you've given us eyes to see this, that you've changed our hearts to want this. You've redirected us. You've, you've done everything. You've caused us to be born again. And so we thank you for this. And I thank you for the amazing inheritance that you, the, the inheritance that you have for your son whom you love for all of eternity is the inheritance that you say we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What is laid up for us is unbelievable. It's eternal and it's with you in perfection with no more sin or decay or destruction. God, that's our hope. Let this world not be it. Let us keep marching on to Zion. Let us keep helping each other journey to this eternal home that we will dwell in forever. And Lord, I thank you that I feel so protected because my faith would have already been dead. I thank you that you protect it and you just know all the right things to grow it. You know when to put it in a wilderness. You know when to let it see how weak it is. You know when to bring it out, when to establish it. And so God, I just feel so safe in a a father with perfect wisdom who knows exactly how to purify my faith specifically. And I pray every heart would be overwhelmed this morning with a father like this. God, thank you for the way you have worked in each life here. Let no one be bitter. Let no one despise the hand of God that has been protecting them through faith. God, we worship you. We thank you for how safe we are in your hands. And it's in that sweet and precious name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.